Hi, good morning. We're going to get started for real this time, so if everyone could find their seat, that'd be great. So on behalf of all of us at the Treatment Research Institute, I want to welcome you today to our second public forum celebrating the importance of translating addiction research into impact. These are made possible through a generous, unrestricted gift from the Reckitt Ben Kieser Foundation for uh, continuing education. So if anyone is interested in receiving continuing education credits today but has not already registered, please see someone at the front desk and we can get you signed up. We're honored today to have Dr. George Koob, the director of the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, to start off the discussion. Following Dr. Koob's presentation, we have an outstanding group of panelists with us today, each of whom brings a unique perspective to the issue. At Treatment Research Institute, we believe that in order for research to be truly impactful, it must be effectively translated into improved programs, policies, and practices. Our panelists are making this translation a reality through policy making, design of insurance benefits, providing clinical care, and working to bring research-based solutions to commercial markets. It promises to be a robust discussion. And we want to hear all of your perspectives as well. So please find inside your folders index cards. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, our speaker, or any comments that you wish to make, please write them on the index cards in your folders. Staff will be circulating after the presentation and throughout the panel discussion to collect these and give them to our moderator. Uh, I also just wanted to mention for anyone who hasn't already found it that the restroom is in the front of the room and to my left. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce the CEO of the Treatment Research Institute, Dr. David Gasfriend, to come up to the stage. Thanks very much. Uh, first, I want to thank Abigail Woodruff for this uh, uh, terrific organization. This is our second event in this series uh, this year, and uh, it is equally well attended as our first addressed by former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that the only thing I have to apologize for is that we didn't realize we needed more chairs. Um, but fortunately, we had enough food. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, if you're not familiar with Treatment Research Institute, let me just say a couple things. TRI is about 100 individuals, 65 full-time staff, who are uh, Around, the Institute's been around for at least 23 years now, uh, founded by Dr. Tom McClellan, um, who is now the chairman of the board. And it was founded to push the boundaries of science into translation, into pragmatic, effective, practical treatment, uh, tools, interventions, prevention efforts to improve the state of substance use disorders and the care of patients and the service to families throughout the United States. Um, that's why we're so glad to be able to host Dr. George Koob today. Um, Dr. Koob is a scientist. Um, he is devoted to the uh, neuroscience of the brain, but also how alcoholism plays into the natural state and vulnerabilities of human reward system components and stress system components. Um, uh, Dr. Koob's scientific achievements are getting to the point that um, when they start talking about the potential Nobel Prize candidates, we keep looking for his name because um, when he stops being a young man, um, we expect to find him uh, there someday. Um, just as an example, Dr. Koob has authored over 650 scientific peer-reviewed publications. That's more than some of us have read. Um, he's uh, one of the world leading authorities on not, not just one neurotransmitter system, which is often the case, but I, I, I could go on. It's dopamine, norepinephrine, GABA, glutamate, um, CRF, uh, neuropeptide Y, orexin, vasopressin. If you think of pretty much any of the uh, critical, hot neurotransmitter topics in science today, Dr. Koob has done um, foundational work in these areas. Um, 
but beyond the neurotransmitters themselves and their direct effects, the neurocircuitry of the brain um, between the, neuro, uh, the nucleus accumbens, uh, the strata terminalis, the amygdala, these crucial brain regions. And beyond that, um, the very interesting nuances of balance between the reward and the stress systems of the brain. So he really is a unique scientist and therefore almost exactly today, a year ago, was appointed to become the director of the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse. And he has served in that position um, very beautifully, not just from the scientific perspective, but one of the crucial issues for our nation is the collaboration between the drug and alcohol research institutes. And uh, I think on the basis of his own character and personality, he not only has the vision to collaborate and coordinate effectively across those, that divide, but actually uh, on a personal basis, his friendships and mentorship efforts make him naturally suited to help bridge that divide, which really the country needs in order to get the most effective um, benefits of our scientific enterprise. So on the basis of all of that effort, uh, TRI is very pleased to be awarding our Innovator Award to Dr. George Kube. And Dr. Kube, if you would come up, I want to present you with the award. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. George Koop. So I'm not a PC person, so somebody sh flip this to my talk, please. There we go. I did figure it out. So thank you very much, and it's a real honor to be here. And, um, I really want to thank TRI for all their efforts in, in making this uh, morning happen. And, and I hope that I can uh, live up to your expectations. But I, I want to talk about how science informs diagnosis, prevention, treatment of alcoholism. In other words, how do we translate research, basic research, uh, to increase impact? And so, I mean, effectively, the reason I took the job at NIAAA was to move what we have learned over the last 30 years in the neurobiology of addiction to the real world. And that's really an enormous um, goal. But as I've spent now nine months at NIAAA, I really think it's an attainable goal. So I hope today to explain to you how we're, gonna, how we're planning on going about that. And, and I might add that you know anyone who has suggestions, and I've certainly already on many from many of you, please send them to us. I'm, I try to listen and we'll, we'll see how they merge with what we're planning on doing and they probably give us ideas for things that we haven't thought of. So it's always important to get your feedback. So I'm going to talk about uh, these items, the scope of the problem, science, the neural circuitry of addiction. Um, I don't get too terrified. It's going to be a very simple lesson in neuroanatomy. Uh, science and diagnosis. So how does, how does what we know about the neurobiology affect science and diagnosis, the treatment, prevention, 
And then the last part of my talk, I'm really going to focus on an area that is, we think is becoming critical at the Alcohol Institute, but also the National Institute on Drug Abuse feels this is critical, and that is the adolescent brain and the impact of drugs of abuse and alcohol on the adolescent brain. And I'll focus, of course, today on alcohol. And then in, in, at the end, it, interwoven will that would be some of the new initiatives we've already started at NIAAA. Some were started before I got there, but will be some of which will be um, moving forward quite uh, rapidly, I hope. So m most of you know that the cost of alcohol, tobacco, and drug addiction is, is, is huge. And in, in fact, from, from the perspective of how much money is put into and, and support is put into uh, trying to understand these diseases and, this, and, and treat them, it, it's minuscule in comparison to the cost. And I, I don't think it, you have to be a rocket scientist to know that if we treated addiction and alcoholism, we would save enormously on health care costs. And I think that's what I, that's the main message uh, if you want to bring it to a, a, a public perspective, from my perspective. So, you know, alcohol impaired uh, driving fatalities uh, are still loom large. Um, we're having an, inc I'll speak to this more later, but while there is a slight decrease in the number of adolescents in the college age zone who are actually drinking, the intensity of drinking, and any of you who have teenagers know this, the intensity of drinking is dramatically increasing. So we have a 67% increase in hospitalization related to alcohol overdoses uh, in 18 to 24 year olds. Cirrhosis deaths in 2009, about 50% of alcohol related. Uh, um, just a factoid from the UK that I received recently, there's been a 119% increase in cirrhosis of the liver in the United Kingdom in under 30-year-olds in the last 10 years. Under 30-year-olds, right? Think about what, you have to drink a lot to get cirrhosis of the liver. And then um, sexual assault is another area that alcohol impacts uh, fairly dramatically. And, and I guess the one that's probably dear to the heart of TRI is that only 10% of individuals with alcohol use disorders get any kind of treatment at all. And this has become a very large priority for us. I was just talking to Chuck O'Brien about this, and it's really an important part of, of our mission. So alcohol, uh, NIAAA supports research to study how alcohol can affect the health and well-being at various stages of life. Um, and this includes, we have a large portfolio on fetal alcohol syndrome. I'm not going to talk about that we, today, but uh, just trust me, it's going very well. It's directed by Ken Warren, my deputy director. Um, we have a, a huge amount of work on, on these other domains, and I'll be speaking about them in the course of what I want to talk about today. But we really uh, are interested in alcohol's effects across the lifespan. Um, and we do ne neurobiology, metabolism, genetics, epigenetics, epidemiology, and we do health services research. So what's the science piece to the science translation? So this is, uh, this is your brain on drugs, okay? It's not a fried egg. It's actually circuitry. Um, and there's a heuristic part to this, and I've spent a lot of my career working on things that contribute to this diagram, have as have many others, some of whom are in this room. But we've conceptualized addiction in a very uh, straightforward way, that, uh, in a phenotyping way, that means that there are three stages. And generally, this agrees with most people in the field. The binge intoxication stage, I think that's self-explanatory. Withdrawal negative affect stage is pretty much self-explanatory, though I focus here on, on the, the emotional state of, of the organism and the person. The preoccupation anticipation stage, I, I need to, to, to mention in, in a little bit of detail, what we're talking about here is basically craving, which is now a DSM-5 criteria, largely thanks to the efforts of, of individuals like Chuck O'Brien. And this is color-coded. I hope you can see the colors, but the, but, but the blue is largely basal ganglia, and if you don't know what that means, that's the part of your brain, deep in your brain, that basically initiates movement and uh, 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 coordinates uh, your interest in, in 
cues in the environments that have high salience. Uh, the red is, is focal point is the amygdala, and that basically encodes negative emotions. And again, is deep in your brain. Even, even a lizard has an amygdala. Um, and then the green, it, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to, to notice that this is largely in the outer part of, of this circuitry, and that's your cortex, and most importantly, as I'll spend a lot of time talking about, your frontal cortex. And I'll mention this several times, but your frontal cortex is the front end of your cortex that basically is important for executive function and making choices, and I'll repeat that in other times. All of these interact, all right? They're not independent. They interact. They set up each other. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that in detail, but what I am going to tell you is that you can lock in and correspond each one of those colors, the blue, to the, what I call the bottom line of the neurobiology of addiction, which is that it's an incentive salience disorder, and I'll explain what that means a little bit later, but even bumblebees and honeybees have to find the flowers that give nectar, and they release a transmitter probably octopamine in bees, but in humans it's dopamine that locks in that cue in the environment to tell you that something good is out there. And it's part of our everyday life and important for all of us, but it gets overtaken by drugs of abuse and alcohol. Addiction is a reward deficit disorder. That's the red part of the diagram I just showed you. This reward system goes haywire when it's overused. And at the same time, and in parallel, and very interesting work, one of my passions, engages the brain stress systems and the brain negative emotional systems. And finally, addiction is an executive function disorder. And this is probably the most insidious part of the addiction process and the brain because this is your frontal cortex. This is the part of your brain that makes decisions, that allows you to delay reinforcement, that asks you to it's what Anna Rose Childress always calls the stop system. This is the system that tells you, wait a minute, maybe I don't want to have that third or fourth, fifth drink of alcohol in a, in, a, in a short period of time. So how does this impact diagnosis? How could we take this science, this neurobiology of addiction? I've just given you a lesson on the um, neurobiology of addiction, a very short one. But I've, I made a couple of key points. It's a circuitry problem. Um, driven by synaptic elements, and we know a good bit about that circuitry. We're learning more uh, every day and how that circuitry interacts and how it goes wrong. So what about diagnosis? Well, one of the areas that we're interested in is, is not supplementing or replacing the DSM-5, and I don't want to get anybody excited or negatively excited. But the idea is, and we're going to start working on this, and our plans are to start working on it with our intramural program at NIAAA, but is to, is, to, is to start measuring these stages of the addiction cycle and these domains that I just outlined to you, incentive salience, reward deficit, executive function, in the context of neurobiological measures, which we can do with imaging, neuropsychological testing. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but we can actually now fairly accurately predict when a child is going to develop fetal alcohol syndrome based on a neuropsychological test battery and by 3D imaging of, face, of, the, of the face. Um, some of these things, that, that's pretty, you know, unrelated exactly to the, the circuitry of addiction, but it gives you an example of how far the biology and, is coming and what, what the potential is to utilize that for diagnosis down the line or as an adjunct to diagnosis. And similarly, you'll hear me talk about this later, human laboratory studies I think are going to loom as an important way of measuring responsivity, response to stress, for example, might be an index of someone who is on the verge or on the crossover toward uh, uh, an addiction-like phenotype. So this is an area we're going to start a little work on. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the National Institute of Mental Health. They've taken this forward in a much larger uh, way. We're going to do it in a very specific way, dedicated to one disease, if you will, for the moment, um, substance use disorder on alcohol. What about treatment? I'm going to spend a little more time about treatment. 
because this is an area that I was engaged in as a researcher and I hoped it and, and plan on having NIAAA be heavily engaged in as part of our portfolio. Um, this came out when I first started at NIAAA earlier in the spring this year and, and it was an interesting paper because it basically argued, as most treatment providers who've been academics know, that there are medications that treat alcoholism and they work and they have an effect size equivalent, basically, to an antidepressant. And in this particular meta-analysis, they identified a camprosate through many clinical trials and naltrexone, which was started here at the University of Pennsylvania, again by Chuck O'Brien and Joe Vilpatelli, that, that these two drugs are effective in treating alcoholism. But as I told you, only less than 10% of, of, of substance use dependent individuals on alcohol are actually receiving any treatment at all, much less medications. And I want to say at the outset here, I don't expect that medications will ever cure alcoholism per se. I think of medications as hamburger helper. I think this is a way that we can facilitate the process. We're always going to have behavioral therapies and I have a, a, that are effective and useful and necessary for the treatment of addictive disorders. So just to review for you, there, there, um, there have been a whole series of events across the last um, uh, 20 years uh, bringing medications to the forefront for the treatment of alcoholism. The latest is nalmefene, which was approved by um, the European Medicines Agency. This is an interesting drug because it is uh, naltrexone combined with a little bit more efficacy on a, as a cap antagonist. If you don't know what a cap antagonist is, it's a it's a, one of the opiate receptors that makes you feel lousy, okay? So um, not feel good, but feel lousy. So kappa agonists are, produce dysphoria. So a kappa antagonist would relieve dysphoria. And this is an interesting uh, experiment that's going on in Europe. I think of it as an experiment, even though the drug is, being, is, is on the market now. It's gonna be used to treat individuals um, to reduce alcohol consumption, per se, a, a more uh, public health approach than, than you would think of in, in terms of uh, complete abstinence. In this case, it would be someone who's over drinking, taking the drug to reduce the over drinking. Um, I'm going to drill down even further. This is a, a slide that I made up to summarize to a large extent the work I did in my own laboratory over the past uh, 20 years. Um, I like to tell people I, I, I started trying to understand how we feel good and I'm finishing my life trying to figure out how we feel bad. And uh, this slide summarizes how we feel bad. And I just recently wrote a paper on this issue, but I think the work we've done in the addiction field on opponent process, which started again at the University of Pennsylvania with Richard Solomon, makes an argument that there is a part of our brain that codes feeling bad. It's part of our stress axis, and it's absolutely necessary. These transmitters on the left-hand corner up there at the top are all transmitters that will probably be released if a bear came through that door, and you went through that door, right? And if I charted your physiology when you got outside there, assuming you locked the bear in here and you were out there, and, you know, you say, well, a bear would never come through here. Um, I don't know. There was a bear on the NIH campus recently, and they had to trap it out. So. Um, for real. Um, we don't just have, you know, viruses hiding in closets. We have bears walking onto campus. Uh, but these transmitters would be activated, and if I charted your physiology out, your pupils would be dilated, your heart rate would be up, you would be no longer sleepy because of my boring lecture, you'd be wide awake. All of these transmitters on the left-hand side there with the arrows up contribute to negative emotional states. And guess what? They're all activated when you overdo drugs of abuse, and in particular, alcohol. And the other three on the right-hand side there are actually buffers to our arousal stress system. And, and those are neurotransmitters that will help you calm down, albeit slowly, I might add. And that's one of the interesting things about the brain stress systems. And I've circled the extended amygdala to remind you that this is during the withdrawal negative affect stage. But this is a part of the physiology of addiction that I focused on, but it's, a, it's an interesting place to start putting our energy for looking at treatments, 
particularly during protracted abstinence, which extend and cross over into that preoccupation craving stage that we talked about. And, and just to drill down even further, and you're going to find this, I mean, the liver people love this slide, but you may not find it all that amusing, but this is the liver and the brain slide to argue that there are, there are inflammatory pathways that we've long identified with the liver that are activated not only in the liver, but also in the central nervous system and probably in the amygdala, which is a part of our brain that mediates stress. And some of these, like uh, TNF-alpha, have been shown to activate the CRF systems. So this is a burgeoning area. One of my heroes in this area is Fulton Cruz, who has slaved away on the neuroinflammatory cascade associated with alcoholism for a good 15 years, and nobody listened to him. But now people are listening to Fulton, and, and neuroinflammatory systems, microbiome systems, the whole body is involved in how the brain interacts um, in this motivational syndrome we call addiction. So we are fully engaged at the Alcohol Institute in molecular targets, animal models, human laboratory models, and clinical trials as a mechanism by which to develop new medications for the treatment of alcoholism. And, you know, the original thinking in this regard was a linear one. That's the way pharmaceutical industries worked. You just went in a straight line to the clinical trials. But what we're learning, and we're learning throughout NIH at this point, is that it's not a linear process. It's a feedback process. Um, and, and so that's one of the things we're heavily engaged in. We are about to release an RFA um, uh, for a human laboratory network, uh, similar to the one we use for clinical trials. Um, and we hope that we can use existing medications to validate the human laboratory studies, but also use the data from human laboratory studies to validate the animal models. And just to give you an example that's dear to my heart, because we did some of the preclinical work in this domain in parallel with the clinical work, uh, gabapentin just uh, was published as a potential treatment for alcoholism um, by Barbara Mason at the Scripps Research Institute, if I may be a little bit parochial. And we have just signed an agreement with Xenoport um, to use a long-acting version of gabapentin and do a clinical trial through our clinical trials network um, program group at, at NIAAA. We can do about one drug a year, and this is the one that's taken the high priority at this point, but there are multiple other targets that are moving along. Some work on other aspects of the addiction cycle. We have a big program in our intramural program, and some work also in extramural on ghrelin, which is an appetite-stimulating neuropeptide that comes from the gut, but also seems to potentiate craving in human alcoholics. Um, we, as I said, I expect that medications are only going to be hamburger helper. They're going to provide a, 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 a means of helping the brain restabilize homeostasis. We know that these behavioral treatments and, social, and some which interact with the environment all work in helping treat alcoholism. But I want you to understand something that's, that's for me, always been, you know, in a sense, one of the ten science commandments, and that is that behavioral treatments change the brain. Addiction changes the brain in one direction. Our argument is that behavioral treatments change the brain back to homeostasis. What we want to do with medications is amplify that effect, speed up that effect. And that's the way I think of these issues. Um, in this domain, we have a screening and brief intervention for adults. This is the 2005 edition, updated in 2007. It's an evidence-based guide for primary health care pr practitioners to provide screening for their adult patients, provide brief intervention for risk, high-risk drinkers, diagnose DSM Five, it should be read alcohol use disorders and provide treatment or referral to specialty treatment services. But we have to get to the primary care physicians, so this is one of our challenges. It turns out that if, you, if your physician, your primary care physician, just simply asks you two questions, it forms a brief intervention. And one example is if they ask you how much you drink. Now, you're going to lie. We all lie. But then you're going to go home 
or drive home and you start thinking about, how much do I drink? Because this gentleman in a white coat who is high on our, our list of admired people in the United States just asked me how much I drink. So, you know, I think these are, these are things that we can do and we need to do, but, you know, I'll be working with organizations like TRI. How can we get to the primary care physician? We've already had meetings with APA, the American Board of Addiction Medicine, and, and so forth. We do health services research. I put this slide in to remind TRI that we also are working on this, and you're working with us. Um, but we are working on screening and brief intervention in primary care. Um, these, we have grants in all of these areas. We're increasing the use of medications in primary and specialty care services. Um, we're engaging patients in long-term recovery, and of critical importance, I know for you all at TRI, is the quality of care, testing the use of performance measures to improve service delivery and ensure service delivery. So this is a, an exciting area with the Affordable Care Act coming online, something we're going to be putting a lot of energy into. So now I want to just end today with a, a long bit, actually, uh, not a terribly long bit, but I want to drill down into the neurobiology of addiction and make the argument that we have a critical piece of this, and it's not just for alcohol. And so this is my uh, part of my talk that is equally applicable to any drug, all right? And that is the adolescent brain, what I'm going to argue is a moving target. So first of all, we know, as I already mentioned, and I'm just going to quickly go through these slides, many young people binge when they drink. They may drink less frequently than adults, but when they drink, they drink more. And that's what this, this slide shows. Um, and, and if you look on the right-hand side, the number of a drinks per occasion is much more in young people. It's almost become a cultural, uh, I don't know what the word would be, a cultural phenomenon that you have to get as drunk as fast as, as possible and as quickly as possible. I had someone call me up, a reporter from Slate Magazine, a writer for Slate Magazine, who wanted to know what we thought of someone who drank a whole bottle of scotch, 750 milliliters, in 13 seconds. I told him it was like Russian roulette. Um, because that's 17 drinks, and that would put you at a blood alcohol level of around 0.5, which is the LD50, lethal dose 50%. There's been a 67%, as I mentioned in the bullet there, increase in uh, hospitalizations related to overdoses in 18 to 24-year-olds. The negative consequences of drinking you're all familiar with, but with young people, it's particularly egregious. Um, all of these bullets here, I'm not going to go through the, them all, but they're, you're more, much more likely to have unprotected sex. You're much more likely to be involved in sexual assaults. Um, you're, someone related to this to me recently. There's a big, I think it was David Gastron, there's a huge increase in alcohol-related suicides. So all of these are issues associated with um, young people excessively drinking and drinking at all. One that just gets left out of the picture, and I apologize if you well know this, but alcohol can kill you. Um, it suppresses your respiratory drive, and if you combine it with opiates, prescription opiate drugs, it's really lethal because it shifts the dose effect curve to the left. What that translates to is it means that a small dose of opiate combined with a moderate dose of alcohol can kill you. Um, maybe you, you remember this from, from high school or college or, or, or medical school, but alcohol has a very steep descending function when it comes to um, uh, behavioral changes. Ultimately, when you get to about 0.5 gram percent, you're dead. Right? And it, it doesn't take a whole lot to get there if you're drinking it on an empty stomach in 13 seconds. And, you know, the, 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 um, the loss is, is uh, I'm in 0.05 gram percent, sorry. Um, the loss is, uh, you know, are, are profound and, and devastating for each young person that, that's, that is involved in such incidents. And they happen every fall. We had a whole 
plethora of inquiries about this, this this past fall at NIAAA. If that's not bad enough, we know that drinking, the younger you begin excessive drinking, the much more likely you are to go on to have an alcohol use disorder. This has been well established with the seminal work of Bridget Grant and many others with whom she's worked. We actually have a, through the NISARC database, but we have a third NISARC coming out very soon, and, and there'll be some fascinating sources of information there. So why is this so critical? What, what is it about the adolescent brain that, it, that makes this so critical? So I'm gonna go back to my neurologizing. And that what's so critical is that your brain doesn't fully develop until you're 25. And that's what this slide shows. You can see that these colors are still changing. They're not, it doesn't mean your brain keeps growing. It actually, your brain is actually shrinking to some extent because you're pruning excess circuits that get in the way of proper functioning. But this diagram shows you that even at age 20, there's a difference between age 12. And, and, and one of the major parts of this change is in the frontal cortex. Um, and so, as I explained to you earlier now, I'll emphasize that green bits there in the front end of your brain, right above the nose, okay? You don't have to be a neuroanatomist to get this, is your frontal cortex. That's involved in planning, decision making, impulse control, memory, language, processing of social cues. Gray matter goes down, white matter goes up, white matter is circuits, so the circuits are forming and consolidating, and you can see that in, in, in the right-hand panel, all the way until you're 25 years old. If you've raised a teenager, you know what I'm talking about. And um, even more importantly, this frontal cortex control, is, it's, it's not in isolation. The frontal cortex is not a soup in the front of your brain that does nothing. It's connected to those other structures I was talking about, notably one that's in, critically important is your basal ganglia, which is labeled on this slide as striatum. And if you look at this slide, you'll see that the solid lines are developing only in adulthood. And what this means is that adolescents um, uh, have more impulsivity and more responsivity to reward. And that's a fact. And, and that's why they're vulnerable to drugs that do the same thing. And it's, it's more than that, and this is the second piece of this, just an add-on, and you'll notice I've added a structure, and that's the amygdala. And so you may not know this piece, and it's often left out of the puzzle, but the frontal cortex also controls your stress response. And if you don't have a fully developed stress response, then your amygdala becomes more sensitized, more activated when the drug wears off or in some social situation that the, that the young person is exposed to when the drug wears off. And so again, the frontal cortex circuits on the right-hand side here are not fully developed for controlling not only your basal ganglia, which makes you feel good, but your amygdala, which is controlling your stress system. And so just to give you a concrete example of this, adolescent alcohol abusers show strong reactions to alcohol-related cues reflecting strong associated learning. And so the red bits over here on the brain, a lot of which are in the, in the frontal cortex, uh, and uh, indicate that there's greater activation in alcohol use disorder subjects, that's the red color in the ventral anterior cingulate and the prefrontal, and also in limbic regions that the prefrontal cortex controls that are associated with reward and drug craving. So there's a reason why young people have an, an overactivated incentive salient system. And one of the reasons is um, because this circuitry is not fully developed and not pruned and not um, consolidated. And then as alcohol use goes up, cognitive functioning goes down. This is a study showing that there's a direct relationship between the number of drinks per day in young people and their ability to do executive function. And I threw in, just to give you a functional merge aspect to this, that um, the more days you do marijuana, 
the, the, the bigger the memory deficit, and we know that marijuana uh, intoxication reduces, believe me, um, I've seen it in action teaching undergraduates for 30 years, reduces your ability to think and, and remember things. I used to tell my students if they come to class stoned, they're going to be impaired on the midterm and final. But if they come to class stoned and then come to the final and midterm stoned, they're going to be even more impaired. OK, so finally, what are we doing about this? And what is, how does this all fit together? And, um, and what, what can we do in this domain of the adolescent brain? Because binge drinking is a huge problem for, for us at NIAAA, and it, it is a source of future problems. And it's the same probably for the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And so we developed uh, two programs. One is called Nadia, the Neurobiology of Ad Adolescent Drinking in Adulthood, which is a preclinical program. This was established before I got to NIAAA, but I'm fully in supportive of this uh, program. And then we also uh, started ENCANDA, which is the National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Adolescence. And again, this was started before I became, became to NIAAA, but there was a presentation about ENCANDA at our first joint NIAAA NIDA council meeting. And I want you to understand a little bit about how things work in Washington. So we had this joint meeting. Nora and I were working together with our joint councils. And she heard about ENCANDA. And her staff heard about ENCANDA. And that launched us into something I think that's potentially really exciting, which I'll talk about in just a second. So I just want to tell you that, that Nadia has identified uh, uh, a number of interesting uh, neurobiological variables. The first bullet is pro-inflammatory. Innate immune genes are activated, which can lead to disruption of the brain stress systems, as I indicated in the previous slides. Um, it, it reduces adult uh, behavioral flexibility, which presumably is frontal cortex. Uh, and, and, and the circuitry I identified there. Um, there's changes in brain cholinergic neurons, which are, we know are involved in attention and memory function. Uh, increases adult negative emotions, so there's our withdrawal negative affect stage, um, and then the cognitive disruption that, that I've already talked about. Um, we're widely distributed across the United States with some of the, the best people in the field, um, some of whom have worked their whole lives on adolescent um, neurobiology, like Linda Spear, to just give you one example. Um, another example, Subhash Pandey has been working on epigenetic factors most of his career. This is a combination of real great expertise in this domain. The National Consortium on Alcohol and Neurodevelopment in Adolescence the, has just gotten underway. I'm actually uh, tomorrow going over to hear a summary of, of what they've just accomplished in their first year and a half. But they're going to study the effects of alcohol exposure on the trajectory of adolescent brain development in the context of development. The plans are dose, duration, timing effects of alcohol exposure. And then what structural and functional anomalies are the result of alcohol exposure and what predates and may predict heavy alcohol use? We're going to be using neuroimaging, neurocognitive brain markers, and, and that will predict alcohol use disorders. And I, I want to point out to you that, that, that they, what I do know that, that they've accomplished so far is to do some things which is as trivial as uh, validating that all the brain imaging centers involved which you can see distributed again across the United States with some of the world's most sophisticated and productive brain imagers have been coordinated in so that they all are uh, uh, you know, validated to be m making the same measurements. So that led to Nora and I and a number of other people at this joint council meeting to think about maybe we need to do something together that is much larger, because we only have plans for 800 subjects in, in Canada. And so you can think of it maybe as the preliminary study that's going to lead the way to the ABCD study. But we're now engaged in planning a study that will uh, assess the impact of sporadic versus regular drug use on the developing brain, all drugs of abuse and alcohol, explore gateway interactions, identify neurodevelopmental pathways that link adolescent substance use disorder and mental illnesses, and assess the effect of multiple substances in combination. We want to do 10,000 young people, starting from the ages 
of probably uh, 10 to 12. We'll have to stagger, but we had a meeting in May, a really good meeting with some of these top imaging researchers I showed you on the previous slide, and they actually thought we could do this. So that led Nora and I to go forward. Our, a request for information has been out there all summer, and we have a meeting coming up in about two weeks at the Society for Neuroscience to pull together the plans for what we call the ABCD study. It's going to be expensive. There are four institutes involved, uh, NIDA, NIAAA, the uh, National Institute on Child Health, and the National Cancer Institute. Um, we're really uh, very, very excited about this joint program. We think it will be a seminal contribution to the field for the future. It's going to provide an enormous amount of information and data about the etiology and translation of brain changes to substance use disorders. So the last bit is I just want to do some parochial things to mention. We have a college alcohol intervention matrix coming soon that should be launched early next year. Without reading this, it's basically going to be a menu of different prevention options that universities and colleges can use. The argument is that what may work for the University of Pennsylvania may not work for the University of Iowa and may not work for Berkeley, but at each university and college you can pick uh, what, how they've been rated, what the student demography is, how it fits your university, how it fits your budget to some extent. So this is going to be launched early next year. Um, we have a screening and brief intervention uh, uh, for youth guide that is, uh, is um, being launched. And this is a brief, easy to score, empirically based screen for risk, alcohol use, and problems. Um, we believe it will be effective in young people for alcohol use disorders and, again, another way of hopefully preventing um, some of the problems we have with adolescent drinking. We have a lot of resources out there. Those of you who are researchers, I tell everyone that NIAAA has the lowest ratio of grants to program officer at NIH. That means you should be able to call NIAAA and someone should answer the phone, and if they don't, let me know, all right? So there are people to help if you're interested in these programs that we're engaged in. I, you know, I didn't mention it, but there's an enormous portfolio of neurosciences research at NIAAA, heavily engaged as part of the Brain Initiative and with other NIH institutes that form the basis for this translation that I'm arguing from a neurocircuitry perspective. So here's the summary of what I've talked about. Human brain reward, stress, and executive function circuitry is the basis of the pathology and the solution to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. I really firmly believe that. We have evidence-based pharmacotherapies and behavioral therapies for treatment of alcohol use disorders. We're working to boost the effect size of both and also to get them translated into use. Alcohol, particularly in adolescents, super activates the incentive salient system, locks in cues associated with drinking. Alcohol chronically dysregulates brain reward and stress system. Alcohol disrupts the frontal lobes, decision making and impulse control, the hippocampus memory, the amygdala fear and anxiety, and brainstem vital reflexes. The adolescent brain does not fully develop until age 25. Long term alcohol use, abuse, can alter to the trajectory, trajectory of the adolescent brain development and cause lingering cognitive deficits. And IAAA studies are underway to ad understand the vulnerability and resilience factors in adolescent brain development. We want to do a huge study in this regard with NIDA, and NCI, and, and ICHD. And then that's basically the last bullet. Um, I had a lot of help in putting these slides together with my colleagues at NIAAA. Uh, they're listed in alphabetical order here, but they range from Mark Egley, who's uh, in charge of our animal model portfolio, um, to, uh, to Ken Warren, who's in, who's in charge of our um, complete fetal alcohol syndrome portfolio, and many of the other individuals you know, um, and thank you very much.
So I don't know how I did on time, but I'm happy to answer questions if you want questions specifically for me or whatever. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike and Scott. I am the behavioral health reporter with WHYY in Philadelphia and also host of our weekly health and science show called The Pulse. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you for the presentation. It's very enlightening in terms of all the things that are happening in the science of understanding and treating addiction. We now have a whole panel joining us, and we will also be taking your questions, so please write them down. I think everybody has an index card, and then they'll be collected and passed on. So first we'll do a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll do some audience questions as well. So joining us now is John O'Brien. I mean, we know, <laughs> we know George Coop. And then we have John O'Brien. He's Senior Policy Advisor for Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group at CMS. We have Terry Fadum. He is Senior Fellow at Mac Institute for Innovation Management at the Wharton School. And we have Barbara Kissenmacher. She is the Executive Director of Hazelden in New York. Thank you all so much for being here. And perhaps just as a way to get started, could each of you talk a bit about your work and how it impacts the discussion and the problems we have, we have spoken about so far? Why don't you start, John? Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, uh, a number of folks had asked me to come, and I uh, jumped at the chance of being able to, uh, number one, do this, number two, uh, meet uh, Dr. Koob, uh, who we've um, not really met before. Uh, but uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, I, actually, I flipped that around. I always want to make Medicaid first because I work in Medicaid. Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, has really been trying to uh, work over the last three or four years on messaging uh, what is good mental health and substance use services. Um, you may or may not know this, but at least on the mental health side, we're the largest payer uh, around mental health services. About 30% of all mental health expenditures uh, come from the Medicaid program, and that's followed by commercial. Uh, as it relates to substance use disorder, including alcohol use disorders, uh, that number is a little bit different. It's about 11% of all expenditures, but we anticipate that that will grow uh, fairly significantly over the next several years, mostly because of uh, some of the changes in insurance and some of the changes, frankly, in the Medicaid program uh, that uh, allow individuals that were not previously covered to be covered and, oh, by the way, requiring the state that covers them to offer alcohol services and substance use services. Um, we've got a number of goals uh, that we have identified in this particular area that are very consistent with what I think Dr. Koob said. Uh, but the a few that I just want to point out and happy to talk about this uh, uh, later on is we want to increase the availability of evidence-based practices. So those were certainly some of the practices uh, that Dr. Koob uh, talked about. And um, you know, one of the ways that we do that is, again, working with our state partners because Medicaid is a state-federal partnership in terms of giving them good resources about what makes sense in terms of coverage. And about two months ago, uh, with the assistance of NIAAA, NIDA, SAMHSA, CDC, uh, we uh, actually put out a bulletin to the Medicaid directors about medication-assisted treatment uh, and um, felt that it was really important, number one, to let them know what the evidence was behind that practice, and number two, to try to dispel some of what had been going on out there and continues to go on out there around the restrictions of access uh, to that medication for a variety of reasons. The other thing that we are ab about to launch, uh, hopefully within the next month, is another informational bulletin specifically on adolescence and substance use disorder. Uh, and uh, a lot of that stemmed from some of the work that SAMHSA did now almost, gosh, three years ago in terms of trying to figure out what were the right <clears throat> interventions. So again, you know, we're wanting to do more work in this space. Um, we are not clinicians. Um, we, we write bills, or we write checks. We, um, we think we pay the bills. Uh, we hope we pay the bills, 
uh, but we really rely on our um, uh, other agencies to let us know what are the right practices that we should be messaging out there. And at the same time work with our states to say what is it that you should be buying out there because there's a lot of pressure on our states to really think about refinancing what exists out there, um, which may not be bad, uh, but probably doesn't always include uh, some of what Dr. Koob talked about, or if it does include what Dr. Koob talked about, it's about a fraction of what um, states are spending. So um, I, I think that's my couple of minutes on what we're thinking about in this, in this area. All right, let's move on. So uh, thank you for inviting, is this on? Yeah. I can't hear myself. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I'm kind of on the business end of things. Um, I, I, I sit in the gap between what we know in science and want to do in science for the benefit of people and, and mankind and then look at what the market values in terms of solutions. And my role in this and my interest in this is finding innovative solutions to problems that the marketplace values. So uh, Dr. Koob made an interesting point in his discussion that there's a huge opportunity in the market, yet no one seems to be willing to step up and face the problem, and how do we reduce this cost in the healthcare system? I'm happy to answer questions as to why we might not do that um, uh, later on in the question period. I'd also like to uh, come up with uh, uh, one other point that he made. So there's a Dr. Cruz that you mentioned in, in your talk, and, and your comment was, well, we should have listened to him 15 years ago. So, so when you think in an innovative way, the people who we're not listening to now are the people we should be listening to. That sounds a little bit uh, 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 odd, but, but that's what I look for, and that's the space we call innovation, particularly when it comes to addiction problems, because the solutions we have are moving along incrementally. We're not making these huge leaps in the market, and it's because the market is telling us we don't value the solutions you have. I mean, I hate to be as blunt about it as that, but that is, in fact, the reality. So I'm looking for, and I look for with uh, academic institutions mostly, but also, with startup businesses, what are the innovations we can see now that will have application in the future? Because we have to start now to get them out to the market in, in four or five years. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my, that's the role I play. Okay. Hi, good morning. I'm Barb Kistenmacher. I'm a clinical psychologist. My role is the executive director for Hazelden in New York City. As you might know, Hazelden and Betty Ford recently merged, and we have sites all over the country. Every uh, ASAM level of care you can imagine, from detoxification all the way to non-intensive outpatient treatment. Uh, if you don't know Hazelden, raise your hand because I assume everybody does. And meanwhile, it's probably there's probably a whole lot of folks who don't. So I don't want to tell you what you already know. Does anyone not know Hazelden Betty Ford? Okay. So. Um, my training was in couples and family therapy. My, my doctoral work was out on the West Coast, and, and my passion is really working with couples and families. I came to the East Coast and did my postdoctoral work in addiction. And then since then, my career has just pretty much been focused on bringing evidence-based practice to real-world settings, whether that's as the director of addictions treatments in a South Bronx hospital, whether that's working at Columbia with the Madison Avenue crowd, uh, folks of means and prominence, or whether right now it's at Hazelden bringing really accessible, affordable, and, and uh, valuable care to folks who have commercial insurance. So I've worked across the spectrum in all socio you know, economic populations, and my passion is really translating what the best of all uh, treatment, the best of all treatments uh, to real world practice. So I'll speak if you want to ask any questions about ground level application of what to do in a treatment program, or if you're shopping for treatment, I can certainly tell you how to look for the best treatment. Yeah. Barbara, let me ask you a follow-up question. George Coop said medication was like hamburger helper in a treatment setting. In your perspective, coming more from, from counseling and working with couples and families, what is the role of medication and where does the kind of counseling and, and therapy work that we have traditionally thought of come in and what's the role of that? Sure. Uh, medication uh, can help it in a number of ways, particularly with cravings. Uh, again, when you say medication, we're not just thinking about medications for substance use disorders. As you know, many folks struggle with other co-occurring mental health issues in addition to substance use problems. So for, for us, it's, it all starts with a really great assessment. You have to make sure that the person who's evaluating the patient 
for medication, is credentialed, is an addiction psychiatrist, for example, you know, has expertise in that area. And then after a good assessment happens, uh, depending on the medication that's being prescribed, it's really important that you educate the person who's taking the med medication on, you know, what is this for, what's it not for, when are you supposed to take it, how much are you supposed to take. But I think medications can help people with craving, they can help people regulate emotions that may be difficult to regulate without the help of the hamburger helper, so to speak. Uh, at Hazelden, we do a lot of education about the role that the medication plays such that then someone can start to get their feet on the ground, start to feel feelings that maybe they weren't feeling when they were uh, medicating those feelings on substances. And eventually, you know, the goal is to maybe not be on a lot of medication or, or the same medication that you started on. Mm -hmm. Terry, let me follow up with something you said about who were not listening. Have, do you have any examples of people who are not listening to right now who might have innovative ideas how to tackle this issue? <laughs> so, so that, that, I mean, that's and a great also, question. why is this such a tough, you, you did say you were right. going so, to talk about why so, this is um, so tough. This is, I mean, this is the area I work in literally every day, and, and it's, it's, um, it's one of language. So we have the language of science uh, on, on the end we've just heard about. And, and the marketplace doesn't understand the language of science. It's not that we don't speak English. It's just that when someone says, this is really good, it'll benefit a person, the, the marketplace says, well, what's the value of that? So, so it has to translate. And the marketplace is this amorphous thing. No, the marketplace is businesses. It's people like you and me and everybody else who work for a business or work in the commercial space where we're looking for how do we affect the bottom line. Saving money is all, although really interesting, and, and most uh, chief financial officers of any company really like to save money. Most of the rest of the company is interested in making money, and therein lies the problem. So, so uh, not having a sustainable uh, 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 business uh, model that, in, that brings um, this type of uh, uh, of a problem into the business is one that, that is uh, particularly painful. Um, some businesses, some major corporations, uh, do have programs whereby they help their employees or their employees' families. And that's, uh, although, you know, we, we look at EAP programs now as a relatively common phenomenon in big corporations, it's not widespread. And, and I would guess that most of the people in this country don't work in big corporations. We already know that. And so if the 10 to 15 percent of the population that works for large corporations have access, you know, what about the other 85, 80 percent of the population? So, so the problem is bigger than just, well, I'm a company and I can go get an EAP program. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, so, so let me get back to language because I think that's the critical issue here. Um, in, in, uh, the other thing I like that Dr. Koo mentioned is asking the question. So, so one of the things that we don't do is we don't ask a lot of questions. The scientists here in an academic center like Penn go, talk to industry and they say, hey, let me tell you about this great science that we've got, this great solution. And the industry people sit there, and I was an industry guy once upon a time, and think, well, you know, how is it going to make me any money? I mean, really, that's it. I mean, I'm going to be crude about it. But in effect, that's the, I'm translating that down to the basic level. You ask actually much more uh, diplomatic questions. Um, what does it do? Who benefits? How many people are like that? You ask all the marketing questions. But at the end of the day, that, that's the issue. So I think the question uh, um, is if you could identify people, and, and I'll cite you an example in a moment, who are on the edge who don't know necessarily that what they don't know, but are willing to go out on the edge and say, look, these are something, this is something I believe and we need to invest in this. So there is a medical institute, which I, I, I will not name up in New York, it's in upstate New York, where they treat cardiology patients primarily. But the issue that came up is they were beginning to see cardiology patients with addiction problems. Um, it just is one of the things you see, right? So, so uh, they began saying, well, we can't just treat the heart, we've got to treat the person. And, and then when they, dis they discovered, so they built rooms in this institute to treat people, and then they discovered, uh oh, it's not just the person, it's the family. So, and, and I can tell you, I'm working with them right now, they are struggling with how do we do this? They're, they don't really know how to do this, and this is a, an institution uh, of higher learning, full of physicians and clinicians who really do know people and do know medicine, but struggling with, well, how do we put, you know, how do we treat this? It, it, and, and this is not just the person. This is the whole context in which the person lives. 
And, and so what, what I've been doing with this institute and with other institutes is, uh, you know, who's the outlier? Who's the person that walks in the room and says, well, you know, all these people are really nuts? And, and, and I think they can't see the problem. And so who are the really left-brain thinkers who are willing to, you know, bring those thoughts into the marketplace? So I won't name names. Uh, I could, but it would be public and embarrassing and probably result in lawsuits. So <laughs> it's probably not a wise thing to do on a public forum. But, but these are the things that all of us know. And we all know people who are like that. We all know people who think a little bit differently than the rest of us, who think there's something wrong with the program we're doing. Who, and so those are the people listen to what they're saying. That, that's that's uh, all I can tell you. Because they have innovations tucked away in their brain somehow. And your job and my job, actually, uh, is to find the key that translates that innovative idea into some uh, a marketable uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me turn back to you, John O'Brien, and then we'll get to these questions. I wanted, we wanted to talk a little bit about the effect of the Affordable Care Act and how that might impact addiction treatment. I'm thinking, for example, there is a brand new initiative at Temple University Hospital here in Philadelphia that TRI is involved in because <coughs> Temple was starting to get penalties for high readmission rates, like many, many, many other hospitals, and they realized a lot of the people who were coming back were coming back because they had addiction problems, so now they've teamed up to make an impact and to have sort of a wraparound program for their frequent flyer patients, so to speak. So what are some other ways in which the Affordable Care Act might impact how we do things and how we kind of do addiction treatment across disciplines? Well, you mentioned just one of them, which is, you know, we, we had the carrot and then now the stick in terms of uh, the penalization of uh, providers and or carriers that uh, aren't showing really a change in uh, either readmissions or hospital or uh, emergency department use. We know this population uh, actually has much higher use of emergency departments uh, and to some extent inpatient use than the general population, at least in the Medicaid program. Uh, and so one of the great provisions of the Affordable Care Act has been around Section 2703, which is called Health Homes. Uh, and uh, when uh, that first came out, SAMHSA and Medicaid partnered together to go and do a roadshow to the states to say, pay attention to this because the health homes really targeted six conditions, two, oh, by the way, were mental health and substance use. Uh, the, I think there was lots of interest in the mental health side because the data was available for the mental health um, uh, individuals that had mental health conditions that showed gosh, look at uh, their um, medical use, it's kind of off the charts. We didn't have it on the substance use disorder side because we didn't have a lot of data because a lot of those folks were uninsured. So now as we get more people insured that have a substance use disorder, uh, we're beginning to see the same things. And oh, by the way, states are saying, huh, now let's focus on substance use disorders. And so we've got Rhode Island, we've got Vermont, we've got a few states that are out there that are using that initiative uh, that includes some really, um, co I shouldn't say common, common sense services that we didn't buy, we don't always buy common sense services, uh, but also change the way that we pay the providers so that the incentives were right, uh, so that it wasn't kind of fee for service. Uh, and, oh, by the way, track outcomes, uh, which again, you know, we are really trying to say to states, it's not just about let's buy the service, it's more about the end game. Did buying that service really make a difference? Uh, and so that's one of them. The other thing that I will just say, the Innovation Center uh, is um, a fairly large initiative. Uh, billions of dollars of, of, of money went into the Innovation Center to test things at the provider level and test things at the state level. Uh, we're about to launch in the next two weeks uh, the Innovation Accelerator Program uh, that is going to be working with as many states as um, we can or as they want uh, around substance use disorder and really trying to accelerate um, some of the practices that Dr. Koob was talking about, what Nora talks about, uh, in order to, um, again, try to get traction so it doesn't take something 20 years uh, to get into mainstream provider communities. Mm -hmm. Let's start with some of your questions. This one is for Dr. Koob and I guess also Dr. Kismacher could weigh in on this. What do you consider as the main reasons that people who go through addiction recovery relapse at one point, and what can we do to improve the relapse rate? 
No, re relapses are caused by multiple factors, but th there's a story I like to tell that has two sides to it. So, and, and the bottom line is, my answer is your brain is changed when you have a substance use disorder. And it, it, there are changes that recover and there are changes that are permanent. So this story tells both. So Dolph Pfefferbaum and Edie Sullivan at Stanford over the years have, have done a lot of imaging study on alcoholics. And they did a, a series of studies where they imaged the brains of alcoholics doing tasks that stress their executive function. In other words, decision-making process. So you take a group, they, in one study they took a group of recovered alcoholics and they took a group of controls and they subjected them to a go, no go task, which is similar to what you do for your ophthalmologist where you have to click a button when you see something in the visual field, only in this case you have to withhold responding for certain stimuli. And it's, it stresses your executive function system. And, and as you make it more and more complicated for all of us, if we see an A in the visual field, we can click, but if, if, uh, uh, but if they tell us, uh, or a letter of the alphabet, we click, and then they say, don't click when you see a D. We can all do that, but if, they, if you start increasing the number of letters of the alphabet you're not supposed to click on, it starts stressing our executive function system and our response system. And so when they did this study and imaged the brains of these two groups, um, both groups did fine on the executive function. So you have a recovered alcoholics and you have controls. They do fine, uh, even when they push, push the system. And, and, and made it much more difficult. But when they imaged their brains, the controls were using this pathway I was telling you about, frontal cortex, striatum, cerebellum, discrete pathway that you use for executive function and executing these responses. But the recovered alcoholics were using a completely different and much more diffuse pathway. So it's a cup half empty, cup half full kind of story. It means they recover, but the circuitry is forever changed. And that, in my view, makes you vulnerable. It makes you vulnerable to stressors, to cues in the environment. Those are two of the main uh, elements that, that, and then this v v vague response you get from re people in recovery that they just can't put their finger on it, but something changed that day. And you could imagine it could be anything, like uh, a bad dream that, that then re reverberates during the course of the daytime. So I, I, I think, and then once when I was consulting for the University of Pennsylvania, Chuck, I took a taxi out to the airport and the gentleman in the taxi said to me, he said, Doc, you know, he asked me what I did, so I told him. And then he said, you know, Doc, I used to have a problem with heroin. And he said it was 18 months ago. This is one of my favorite stories and it came from here. He said it was 18 months ago. He said, you know, Doc, I'm good now. I'm really good. But he said, you know, every once in a while this little guy in my head pops up and I have to hit him down with a baseball bat. That's recovery or not recovery. Mm -hmm. You have to work at it. I mean, they say that in AA. It's a constant, active process. It's interesting to have this conversation because what we see in, in just the ground level clinical work that we do is very similar. I mean, someone may have had something happen in their life when they were younger. Perhaps it's a trauma of sorts. It could have been that their best friend uh, moved away. It could have been that their uncle was sexually abusing them, but, and I'm not saying that everyone who has a substance use disorder has had trauma, but I'm using this as just an example. So someone may experience a trauma at a young age and they learn to cope with that, or maybe it's just a chaotic family that they're living in, but someone then learns to cope uh, by smoking pot, for example, and that becomes the way that, you know, they escape a certain situation. Later in life, that that pathway of avoidance coping, for example, can be an easier way to deal with negative affect in the context of an interpersonal relationship. It could be a fight with their spouse that brings up something that reminds them of the way that they felt when they were younger. Perhaps somebody's father died when they were an adolescent and uh, later in life their spouse walks out the door and says, I'm never coming back and it triggers an abandonment feeling. Um, so to, to, just to be simple, I think people relapse most often when they're feeling some type of negative affect in the context of often an interpersonal trigger, if I had to sort of just boil it down to a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I'm not very good at that, so thank you.
<laughs> a quick follow-up question on the issue of relapse that perhaps also speaks to treatment becoming more available. For a long time, addiction treatment has been done in the private realm, and a lot of times information about outcomes has not been accessible. I have experienced that as a journalist. I'm sure people have experienced it as parents, as those who want to seek treatment. When you ask, what's the percentage of your people who relapse? What are your success rates? Nobody can give you any numbers. So do you see that changing? Do you think that is important, that people start keep keeping better track of what works and what doesn't on the ground level of addiction treatment. Anybody want to, Barbara, do you want to start with that? Well, well, I certainly agree with you that people should keep track of what works and what doesn't work. And certainly there's a huge gap between what's in the treatment literature and what the general public knows about what works. So uh, certainly there is a wide range amongst professionals in terms of who understands what works versus who is, you know, winging it, so to speak, in, in their private practice, for example. Um, so yes, I agree with you that people should keep track of that. I think that there has to be an easy way for that to continually happen. I think for, for most folks, they want to be on top of the research. They want to know what's going on, and it's more a matter of the how. I know I ran into uh, Abigail in the Yardley Starbucks and found out TRI produces this, Abigail is part of TRI, I'm sorry, uh, produces a, a, Reese, a newsletter, right? A newsletter, and, and I thought, well, I need to get on that newsletter. Because even I, as a person who specializes in addiction, did my entire graduate work and postgraduate work in addiction, you know, I'm responsible for a treatment institute in New York City that's connected to a larger National Institute, it's really hard to stay on top of what's in the literature. So I don't think it's a question of motivation. I think it's a question of uh, capacity and ability for people to stay on top of it. Anybody else want to? Again, I think that's some, something we are very interested in and in continuing to do. It's not just about what does the research tell us and, oh, by the way, states think about doing that. It's once a state actually puts something into place, what tools do they have um, and you know kind of what leverage do they have with the providers to be able to continue to report information that leads us to believe that whatever the provider is doing out there has some fidelity to what the research says number one and number two kind of what's the most efficient way to be able to collect that information because if it's too cumbersome uh, no one's going to be interested in doing it because it's going to cost a lot of money but if there's ways to be able to get that information from just simple payment um, way, uh, uh, payment strategies where you can kind of track some things, not everything, or doing some targeted record reviews, which is, again, a heavy lift, but, um, you know, at least uh, something out there. We got to do that. Mm -hmm. So, Terry, it looks like there's a lot of innovation needed as well in the way we collect and process information, big data. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. So, so one of the interesting questions that, that popped into my mind as, we're, as I'm sitting here is, well, um, everybody's seeing sick people. Right? So, so what about the healthy people? So what about the people who suffered trauma who didn't end up seeking uh, addictive relief to that trauma? Uh, what do we do about studying them? The other thing uh, that came up, and actually there is a study going on here at the University of Pennsylvania of schizophrenics. The uh, reason I raise that is the, the study's going on of the families. Mm -hmm. So who are the people who surround the people with this disorder? And, and, and let's genotype and phenotype those people. So I think a large part of what's going on, which we don't know. So, so we're now getting to the stage, I think, in, in this uh, medical discussion of, you know, identifying what we don't know, mm -hmm. which is healthy. So, so I think that uh, there are some people for whom traumas and other things don't end up uh, deriving this kind of behavior. So what's their genotype and what's their phenotype? And then in the same family setting or in a similar setting, what are the genotypes and phenotypes of the people who are driven to addictive behaviors? And we don't know the answer to those questions, but to me, the ABCD study that you're doing has really got to address that because that's fundamental to anything we're going to do in the future. So anything we do now, good idea, but probably a patch uh, on the tire that's going to eventually still go flat. Uh, but we, we do need the, the better genetics and better diagnostics mm -hmm. to get the answers. We are going to take blood from each of the subjects should this get underway. And, and by the way, in the recent NISARC that Bridget Grant ran, we have 46,000 people responded, but we have 26,000 bloods. 
Wow. So this, it's coming. Great. It's coming. Mm -hmm. Next question. How can parents educate and monitor alcohol use with their teens? Dr. Kuv, you spoke a lot about the importance of paying attention to that. So what are the best recommendations? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, well, that's a tough one since I have it. I don't, he's not a teen anymore. He's just graduated from being a teen. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't really know the answer to that. There are probably people here who are better served with statistics on it. I would say, though, as a parent, it, the, the most important thing is to keep the lines of communication open with a teenager. That's, that's the most critical fact that you can do. Um, it, it's tough. Um, it's tough because, you know, I can only tell you from personal experience in Southern California that it, it's where your kid, what group your kid runs with is often, uh, hangs out with is often a, a, a marker. But if you keep the lines of communication open, it, that, that helps. There may be other experts here who would like to comment on that. Barbara, perhaps. Sure. In my work with uh, families and parents of uh, folks who are addicted, I, I would agree with Dr. Koob that helping them find a way to be interested and involved without being controlling and anxious. Uh, so that, that's the how to keeping the lines of communication open. How do you increase the number of people getting into treatment and how do you address the stigma that surrounds addiction and also mental illness and the two often go together as well. So how can you improve on that number you mentioned, under 10% of people ever getting any help? Well, I mean, it, it's, as you saw from my talk, it's, that's moldy determined. But one of the main focal points that we've been starting to work with large organizations, and we intend to follow through with government agencies as well, is get to the primary care physician. But that, that sounds easy, but it's not, because many of them aren't even educated in addiction. It's not even permeated the medical school curriculum or the residency program. So we're working on, on that's going to be a major focal point. We, you know, we, we really think we need to drill into the medical school community, um, promoting medications development, promoting behavioral treatments, and, and we can do better with behavioral treatments. I mean, uh, uh, mindfulness is starting to be woven into the fabric of, of behavioral treatments with some success. There are a couple published papers now. So I'm open to anything, um, personally, um, in this regard. So, so I'll make a comment on that, because you know, money drives markets. And, and so I think there has to be a financial incentive. To, to make things happen. So, so I'll, I'll cite a case, of, and, and both for the clinician who sees patients, and by the way, I think in this country we talk about the primary care physician, there's only about 120, 130,000 primary care physicians in a nation of 350 million people. So keep that in mind in terms of uh, recognizing what Barbara mentioned before, there's a capacity limitation here in terms of what one human being is capable of keeping in front of him or her at any single point in time. But you know, uh, um, uh, you, you pay for performance, basically. So people will perform, clinicians and physicians will provide the kind of service that they're reimbursed for. So that, that's a message to, to uh, my, my fellow panel member here. <laughs> the other thing is for institutions now that employ physicians. Um, one of the great things that the CTSA grants did uh, out, of the, out of the NIH was force academic medical centers to talk to industry, talk to people in business. I'm not saying that people in business have all the answers, but they're, they're, by forcing, A, the people in academia who don't normally talk to people in the business world, and forcing business people to talk to them just because they're, they're nice and they graduated from these institutions creates a lot of friction. And the friction creates dialogue, and that's where solutions come from. So somehow when money is being given out to uh, people who are awarded grants, there needs to be a mechanism to pay for, to demand that some interaction occur so that a, they understand that the problem is bigger than just their research laboratory or bigger than the business they deal with, and B, they receive some benefit for having had that conversation. I'd so, like to jump in really briefly. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another way, and, and I want to go back to the question too, which is how do you increase the number of folks who get treatment? Mm -hmm. I was um, 
charged three years ago with the task of opening up a structured collegiate sober living facility for uh, wealthy young kids, to be frank, uh, in New York City. And I thought, oh my goodness, what, how did I end up here? Uh, it's three years later. We, we have a fabulous, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's, a, it's a neat building in Tribeca where young adults ages 18 to 29 live. They're going to college all over New York City and they're living in a sober environment. Uh, lots of lessons learned from that, but I went in with my academic background, uh, everything you can imagine, motivational interviewing expertise, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, and these things are all wonderful and being integrated in the work that we're doing, so I'm not trying to, to poo-poo that, but one thing that we learned over the last three years is that um, these young people, if they're having a blast together, and they're not using substances, it's contagious and it's free. Uh, we have 13 or 14 self-help, 12-step groups on site. New York City is full of self-help community meetings. Uh, I know there's is another topic, and I don't want to sidetrack, but the divide that's been created in the addiction community around 12-step versus other treatments, I don't even understand it because they're all evidence-based, and that's a whole other story, and I think it's about money. But we have young people having a blast in New York City sober, uh, partying on our roof deck with, uh, you know, seltzer and lime, and it, it's not top down. Uh, you get one young person who's motivated, who's, whose father was an alcoholic, who recovered, and they know they have the disease of alcoholism, and they know they want to go to college and be successful. You get that young person in the house, and you get three others, and all of a sudden it's very contagious, and all it is is about having fun together as young people. So um, there, there's also, I think, I'm not contradicting anything mm -hmm. that's been said on the panel, it's just uh, the young people themselves create these movements of what's cool and what's fun, and, and that's more powerful than anything I could have done in my behavioral checklist of, of whether they're making curfew or not. I mean, we still do the behavioral checklist, we still do random drug testing and all these other behavioral things, but... Mm -hmm. so, and self-help is free, it's in the community, and it's happening all over, and uh, that, that then pe brings people to treatment. It brings people to these other uh, ways of getting well. So I, I think um, a couple things. One is um, in looking at why only 10% of individuals actually seek or get treatment. Some of it was because they didn't have payment. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is to make sure that people have an insurance card to be able to get treatment. But that's only a third of what we think of as the major problem here. The second, the, the larger problem is um, we now have a workforce shortage. We had a workforce shortage going into 2014. Uh, we have a uh, increased workforce shortage uh, as we move past 2014. We don't necessarily have the number of people to be able to deliver the services, and certainly we can change the incentives to encourage more people to provide the service, but that's um, going to be a little long road to hoe. And so, you know, some of what we have to think about is the shortage and how to be able to address the shortage because we've eliminated, at least in many states, one of the reasons, which is payment. Another question. Alcohol addiction often comes to light when someone is arrested for a criminal act. What is NIAAA's position on mandating treatment for these individuals and offering diversion strategies? Or I feel anybody could, that's a policy question. I guess sometimes people are mandated to have treatment anyway, right, in certain cases? I don't, I don't think we have a position on, on that that I'm aware of. Uh, the, uh, Tom, does, does another agency make those policy? I think it's a statewide <clears throat> phenomenon, isn't it? I mean, we have drug courts in California, because I lived in California for 30 years. Um, and, and, well, what's and, your take? And each, <laughs> each state, uh, deals with this differently. I think the drug courts have had some success, um, and certainly, um, but I, I, I'm not, I'm just really not up to date on, um, on this issue. Maybe some of the other panelists can talk to this. Yeah. I'll make one brief point, which is people come to treatment for all kinds of reasons, and external motivators are quite effective 
uh, almost every human being who's having a struggle has some form of internal motivation to make a change, but that internal motivation isn't always apparent to them until they get really good help. So uh, if you start with an external motivator, it, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I don't know how many patients have told us, I am so glad my wife said I was, they, she was going to leave me if I didn't get help. Now that's a different kind of external motivator. It's not court mandated, but it's still coercion into treatment. I, I don't know how many patients have told us, I am so glad that I got in trouble at work and they forced me to go to the EAP because now I can father uh, my six-year-old son way better than I ever would have if somebody didn't force me to go to treatment. Chuck, could you could come up and use this guy? <laughs> there are some very enlightened judges out there, uh, and unfortunately, most of it has been published in the law journals uh, as opposed to scientific journals. But uh, there's uh, several courts in Alaska that have been mandated now Trexone for uh, people who were convicted of driving under the influence. And they report very good results you know, in terms of not repeating. Because typically, people do repeat these offenses, just like you know, they relapse. Uh, there's also some examples in Northern California. Um, I, I think the people uh, who make the uh, depot form of naltrexone have some data on this that, uh, they, that you know, they could give to a TRI, perhaps, to put in their journal. But I mean, basically, it, Keeping people on medication that prevents relapse has been approved by the FDA. It works, but fewer than 9% of people getting treatment for alcoholism uh, get any prescription for these medications. And that's the real tragedy because the science has already been done. It's not being applied. And, and in some cases, like there was a, a very interesting series on CNN a couple of years ago where Sanjay Gupta, the uh, journalist, um, followed five patients into uh, a number of famous programs and uh, they all relapsed. None of them got medication, which is par for the course. And then he also followed one outpatient who didn't even go into the residential program. He got put on naltrexone and he was doing great. And then he played that tape for the counselors at the residential programs and not one of them said, wow, we ought to try this with our patients. They simply said, we don't believe in it in our programs. And that's the big problem. There's too many beliefs out there uh, which take priority over science. Thank you. Here's a question for Terry Fadum. Has your group looked into how innovative use of smartphone technology could assist in increasing in increasing the use of continuing care, for example, promoting apps and services that are, sorry, I'm sorting most of your questions by how well I can read your handwriting and I thought I could read this, but I think the well, question. I think I got the gist of it, yeah. <laughs> the so gist we were of just, it is. We were just having this discussion right yeah. before we started. Um, where, where's that group, up at the University of Wisconsin? Um, so there's a group at the University of Wisconsin, and, and uh, you can probably say it better than I can, but, but the apps, uh, uh, phone apps are just amazing. But, uh, you know, what's out there to remind you, you know, to, to help you, uh, you know, give you that friend in your pocket that will uh, vibrate and remind you that you need to do something or need to follow up or take your medication or whatever. I mean, those are all terrific um, applications. I think, you know, the issue, and it's a great question because we're at the very beginning of using social media as a way of improving compliance on taking medication, that's one issue, and in terms of compliance with any behavioral modification program, which is a second issue. And, and we don't even know where this is going to go. But, but yeah, there's a bunch of apps. And I've seen a couple of people, you know, playing around with some apps, but, but those were, what were real ones coming out of the University of Wisconsin, which, uh, which are out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. We just got... We just, got, we just had to do a three-page response to Building 1. That's the uh, main building on NIH campus because a, a, a certain congressperson complained about trivial science, and, one of, and, and the grant was to do exactly what you're yeah. talking about. So uh, we had, I thought, a fairly compelling... Well, you know, all science that starts is trivial at the beginning. I thought we had a fair... You know, it's the, it was the old Proxmire... Um, yeah. kind of thing for those older people here, but I think there's somebody new that, that dings grants for having, wasting taxpayer money. So they, yeah, they decided that this was a, someone decided that, that, that our uh, 
mobile app recovery grants were uh, a waste of money, but I think our rebuttal was fairly compelling. At Hazelden Betty Ford, we have a mobile app. Uh, it's part of recovery management, the, the rubric of just helping people maintain their recovery over time. It's free uh, when they're part of our intensive outpatient program or our residential level of care. Uh, it's called My Ongoing Recovery Experience, and it combines uh, three main evidence-based practices, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, and 12-step facilitation. So people are using this on their phone every day, and you know, again, I don't have the data on more, although we do have the Butler Center for Research at Hazelden, uh, where we do get the opportunity and the advantage to look at the efficacy and effectiveness of some of the things that we do, but I don't know the data on more off the top of my head. Uh, patients love it, they report that it's incredibly helpful. So one of the things we are saying in the adolescent bulletin as a kind of trailer to when that gets out is that uh, apps in particular are going to be really, and smartphones are going to be really important uh, as part of one of the recovery supports for not only the, the adolescent but also the family as well. Um, and that's going to be kind of interesting to see what the Medicaid agencies do with that because uh, at a local level, meaning the state level, uh, the pushback has been when we actually went and wanted to buy technology that wasn't 30 years old for some of our um, uh, clients. Uh, you know, you'll have someone in a state legislature saying, well, you know, my son or my daughter doesn't have a, a smartphone, so why should someone in the Medicaid program have a smartphone? So, it, it, again, I think part of it is kind of pushing it out there, so we're saying if you can figure out politically and sensibly how to buy this, uh, we might be interested in, in letting you do that. Mm -hmm. Let's say perhaps one more question. This one relates to the neurobiology of co-occurring disorders. And I guess the question is directed at, can you really tease apart mental health issues and addiction issues? Or is that going to be very difficult when you do a lot of the brain research that Dr. Coop, you spoke about? Um, yes and no. So, or no and yes. I mean, uh, let's take PTSD, which is uh, an important area. And we, I just, Tom Minsel and I had a joint meeting of some of our senior staff to discuss some joint programs on post-traumatic stress disorder and alcoholism. So there is, there is a good bit of overlap in the Venn diagrams if you look at the biological factors that, uh, that show up as overactive in the brain stress systems between PTSD and alcoholism, and some of you probably already know that 50% of individuals with PTSD it ultimately end up with an alcohol use disorder. Um, I mean, ultimately in the, in their life. So, but it, but PTSD has other elements uh, that that are much more severely disrupted, and as was already discussed. Uh, there are individuals who have post-traumatic stress experiences who don't even develop post-traumatic stress disorder. There are others who certainly do not develop an alcohol use disorder. And so we hope with the modern neurobiology and neurocircuitry that's evolving, we'll be able to show where the Venn diagrams overlap and where they do not, and where, um, you know, co-treatment of, of the disorders is going to be useful and where not. And another concrete example is in major depressive episodes. Individuals who have a co-occurring major depressive episode and alcoholism do respond to antidepressants and it also decreases their drinking. But individuals who do not have comorbidity with a major depressive episode, and it runs around 20, 30 percent depending on what population you're looking at, do not respond to antidepressants as a sole treatment. So, so um, even with the information we currently have, I can say that the, the easiest way to look at this is the Venn diagrams overlap. Sometimes they overlap in certain domains very significantly, in other domains not so significantly. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess in closing, maybe could each of you make a brief statement about <clears throat> we're already looking ahead to the year 2015. So what are some things we should be paying attention to? What are some important steps that are being taken or have to be taken from your perspective? Just a few thoughts on that that we could all 
take home and, and think about? Well, I'll just say that, you know, I think I made this amply clear that addiction is a brain disease, and that's, that's my statement. And I think if, you know, I went to the ASAM meeting this year, um, and, and every presentation, that's the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and every presentation I heard, the speaker led off by saying it was a brain disease, which means to me that we're, we're making progress. Tom tells me that we need to make more progress. So um, I, I think this is an area that um, I'm going to continue to make this argument. Uh, I told Nora Volkoff I've adopted a page from her playbook, and I neurologize everything, including <laughs> prevention. So I gave a talk to the Society on Prevention Research called Neuroprevention. I may overdo it, but what the heck. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so, f for us, we've got um, a lot of things that we're looking forward to in 2015, but I think the one that I'm most looking forward to is to figure out if we can identify the uh, suite of measures uh, that um, we can land on over the next couple of years that we really do want to pay attention to to figure out are we making any dent in some of what we're buying out there. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, there's, um, we're at the kind of this uh, juncture in the market where new technology is going to make a sea change in, in the way in which we monitor ourselves. Now, monitor for health, you know, normal cardiac rates, normal. So these wearable types of monitors and technologies that are able to, you know, passively communicate with you and your clinician or your therapist what your condition is are just beginning to be seen in the marketplace. I've seen some in California. I, I'm assuming they'll... They'll uh, creep through the country very quickly, but I would look at, at that, uh, that place in the market for uh, innovative thinking about how we can address and how we can adapt these technologies uh, to these problems. Like a Fitbit, Fitbit well, well, type Fitbit, thing? Fitbit is kind of, Fitbit's a beginning of that. Yeah, so Fitbit, yes, I used to wear one of those Fitbits, and I found so. out I'm working for Fitbit. I'm not working for me. So, <laughs> so but, it's, but, it, but, it's that kind of, it, but the thinking process is right. You know, what are the things that my machine needs to know about me in order to help me improve? And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the Fitbit. One quick um, thing to mention is that we're about to launch a competition to develop a better monitoring of blood alcohol levels, like a, a miniaturization of the SCRAM device. The SCRAM device is what Lindsay Lohan wore, if you've ever seen the yeah. pictures of her in Hollywood. And they work. The SCRAM actually works. You can get continuous online uh, measures of blood alcohol levels, but our researchers in NIAAA, and you can use your imagination to see how this could be utilized for anything, but we want, we want a simple, um, something you can wear on the runway in Paris d device on your wrist that can measure blood alcohol. And we've, we've done some looking into this, and there are already out there devices where you can take this piece of your finger, just put it on a little pad, and it gets a blood alcohol level that's accurate. So we're, we're going to do that. Hopefully the device will be very stylish if it's in that, Paris. That's yeah. the point. Yeah. That's what I meant by the yeah, runway. Right. Yeah. I got, I got it. Yeah. Not the airplane runway, no, the other one. You gave me a whole new image for Fashion Week in New York. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'll look you up. It'll be right. much utilized there. <laughs> I actually have a Fitbit or whatever it's called yeah, in the trunk yeah. of my car. I'm going to return it at Target for some bath towels. But <laughs> I, I, I won it in a corporate uh, event where there was a competition, and I somehow won the Fitbit. And I thought that's just going to change running for me. I, I'd rather not know how I'm doing when I'm running. But. <laughs> uh, from my perspective, I think it's uh, necessary to translate the evidence-based uh, approaches to working with families into affordable and accessible practice. So I'll give you an example. Uh, addiction is a brain disease, and addiction is, an, is a family disease as well. And I can't tell you the number of times that we work with parents or family members, and they get it. Insight is there, but behavior change is hard to come by. So interventions that help people on the ground level change literally their behavior. Um, and it, it might be parent coaching, but this traditional weekly family therapy model is not enough when you're working with uh, families who are affected by addiction. Well, thank you all so much for being here today, and thank you all for coming. And I guess that's it. <laughs>